welcome in to Wisconsin Sports on the Go with Trage. I'm your host, Trage. It is Monday, Monday, July 15th, a fantastic Monday, July 15th here in the great state of Wisconsin or wherever you're listening out there. We got some storms rolling through. Got some storms rolling through coming up here today, it sounds like, starting in early morning and then working its way through the day. Possibility of pop-up showers, pretty good ones along the way here today. So hopefully, hopefully staying dry out there if you're out there listening. Hopefully you're staying dry. Hopefully you're staying safe. Hopefully the weather isn't too terrible in your area. It was getting dry, right? It was getting dry. We needed the rain. Rain's back. Don't worry. Don't worry. The rain is back. But lots of good stuff. Well, I don't want to say great good stuff. Um, The Brewers were in action over the weekend against the Nationals. There were some good things to come out of that series. Also some bad. Also some, I mean, we saw a guy get DFA'd. So we got lots to dip into with the Brewers. I mean, I just, there ain't a lot going on. Ain't a lot going on. We saw the MLB draft kick off last night. So I want to touch into that a little bit. See where the Brewers were, who they picked with their first couple picks there. Kind of look over those guys. And then also, I mean, just look around the league and see what's going on there. So right away, Right away, though, I want to look at a little bit of Packer, a little bit of Packer chatter, right? And no, it's not Jordan Love and his contract and, you know, officially being done. And we know how much Jordan Love's going to make next year. Because for some reason, for some reason, we don't have that yet. We don't have that information yet. I, I have faith. I have faith it's going to be done before training camp. But still no word. Still no word. For the last thing that I heard was that it was close. It is close, and they're just tuning out. So they're they're making the final details on the contract, right? They're getting up to fine print is what really what they're working on at this point here. So it's getting there, but we're not there yet. So the biggest thing that I saw, not not, not huge, I guess, is a little bit of Devontae Adams chatter, okay? Now, stick with me on that one. I know you're like, I want the Adams chatter. What do you mean? You know, he's not coming back to Green Bay. Not that I know of. No, not that I know of. But we did see Devontae Adams did come out and he talked about the fallout that he had with the Green Bay Packers, that 2021 extension offer that the Packers did offer him. We didn't really see much that came out of it there. But per Devontae Adams, the Green Bay Packers offered – Devante, seventeen million per year, going through into training camp of the twenty twenty one season. Now, that seems like a lot of money. It seems like a lot of money, but we're talking about one of the best, best pass catchers that the Packers had and could be up there with, you know, in that, in that realm of better receivers that green Bay has had. Right. I mean, an all pro caliber wide receiver and the green Bay Packers basically, I mean, 17 mil, he's not even in, you know, the top of the market then for wide receivers. So they're, they're playing that game with a home hometown discount again. We did it with Jones. <clears throat> Excuse me. We we tried to get Jones to take less, right? He was, I mean, Jones was a pretty good running back. And the Green Bay Packers were like, ah, you know, you will you take this? Would you take this little amount of money so that we can afford to go elsewhere? Now, it's something that if you find the right guy, they'll do it for you. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. It's It's actually ideal in some situations for guys to take a little bit less. Now, for that to be the only offer that Green Bay was willing to go for for Devontae Adams, now that that's it, it raises a different question that I guess I have, and that is, what do the Packers value at the wide receiver position? Right, because if you weren't able, if if you weren't willing to go higher to lock up Devontae, right, one and like I said, an All Pro caliper. Why are I mean basically an all pro wide receiver, right? And your best your best catch uh, option, and one of the best in the game at the time. 
If you weren't willing to go out of your way to offer more to Devontae Adams, what tells you now Christian Watson, Romeo Dobbs, Jaden Reed, uh, you know, I'm not going to throw a bull melon into Romeo Dobbs. You know, what, what tells you that you're going to pay that extra dollar to bring them back, to keep them around for a little bit extra? And I, I really don't see it. You know, it's Green Bay, and, and you can't really knock them because they do have a pretty good wide receiver core. You look at last season there, they had a, I mean, Last season there, they had uh, uh, the youngest and the least paid wide receiver room in the NFL. And it worked, right? It it got the job done. So you can't complain too much about that scenario. But now it's about constantly bringing in weapons then. You know, I mean, look at Bo Melton, right? You didn't expect Bo Melton to come in and do that. And Bo Melton became a very good wide receiver in the Green Bay system, right? And he was saying, I mean... Yeah, that's all you can say about the guy. You can't expect to constantly find diamonds in the rough like that, right? And so that's going to lead to, okay, now we got to be constantly looking for weapons. And I'm not saying you don't want to be constantly looking for skill positions because I always say that you can never have enough, right? I You can never have ne- uh, enough tackles, right? Enough tackles uh, for your offensive line, guys who can play tackle because they can usually, I mean, usually, slide into another position than like guard for you or even center. But you can never have enough of the skill position, especially wide receivers. So I'm not going to say that Packers are wrong in kind of working this way. And maybe it does change, right? But Definitely interesting. Definitely interesting that the Packers weren't able to wiggle a little bit more there with their number one option to try and keep them around. I mean, that was a big reason of what kept Aaron Rodgers healthy. He had Devontae. Or what it kept him happy, right? He had Devontae. That always, you know, made him feel it's like his safety blanket, right? He, he Everybody's got a safety blanket. That was his safety blanket. And they weren't willing to work with them. So definitely, definitely an interesting story that I saw. And it was because of the, there's a new show called the receiver documentary. Uh, they were talking to Devonte Adams there. And he was also on all the facts, no breaks by Keyshawn Johnson, their former NFL receiver, Keyshawn Johnson. So we saw, you know, those little bit of videos there and he got tidbits out of it. And that was the big thing that I saw was the ultimately the Packers not able to get that. Um, not able to get that extension, then ending up franchise taking them, then ending up trading them out to the uh Raiders, the Las Vegas Raiders there. And then we all know how it went that the Packers, I mean Sitting sitting good in the wide receiver room right now. So it didn't hurt them drastically, but at the same time, it's like, I mean, you got to be willing to open up page, pay, uh, the, uh, the checkbook every once in a while and possibly sign a guy like this, right? So definitely something to keep an eye on there with the Packers. It's been kind of a growing trend, I guess you could say, that at times they aren't able to or aren't able or willing to open up the uh, to open up the checkbook for some of these guys. So what do they do with this wide receiver room now that they, you know, they're young yet and they're still on their rookie contract. So, I mean, they don't have to worry about it quite yet, but what tells you if say Dontavian Wicks gets, I mean, ends up turning into an all pro, you know, this is hypothetical, but what tells you if he ends up being an all pro Jaden reads right up there with him. Dobbs is playing well, right? What are you going to do then? Because you're going to have to be able to fork over a little bit of money to keep one of these guys. Then you're going to lose the second one, right? So how does it all shake out? It's definitely going to be something to keep an eye on there. So good stuff there. Good stuff there to start it out. And like I said, if you haven't, if you haven't, you can get over there and you can listen to the full uh, interview there with Devontae Adams. That is on Keyshawn Johnson's uh, podcast there, All Facts. 
no breaks there with Keyshawn Johnson, former NFL wide receiver there. But with that, before we move on, before we get to the Brewers for the day here, I want to get to some sponsors of the show here quick. First, game day supply in on Alaska. Do you have a sports club or team? Are you looking for some sweet custom uniforms or apparel? Check out the awesome crew at Game Day Supply in on Alaska to help your team get the sweetest gear. Find them on Facebook at Game Day Supply or online at GameDaySupply.net. Also, Sport and Spine Clinic in Greenwood, Wisconsin. If you've been injured recently, whether it's at work, whether you were mowing the lawn, playing with kids, whatever it was, and you felt something you probably shouldn't have felt and it made you think twice about doing something like that again and you're like i need to get better i need to get more mobile and you think you might need to go to see a physical therapist well you got to get yourself down and see chad at sport and spine clinic in greenwood wisconsin he'll get you right he'll get you back to work back mowing the lawn back playing with the kids feeling better than ever sport and spine clinic in greenwood sports scene sports cards and memorabilia located in the Marshfield Mall in Marshfield, Wisconsin. you got to get down there and see Al. He's got everything you need from sporting cards to memorabilia, jerseys, model stock cars. He's got it all. Sports scene in Marshfield. Marshfield Motor Speedway is located just three miles outside of Marshfield on County Road H. Get down there this summer. Still tons of family fun for all ages. Great food, great drinks, great atmosphere. Nothing better than a great summer day or night down there at the racetrack. So Marshfield Motor Speedway is there in Marshfield, Wisconsin. Pittsville Farm and Home Center. At the store, they serve you anything from hydraulic hoses to red roses. Stop in and see the awesome crew at Pittsville Farm and Home Center in Pittsville, Wisconsin. And also your hometown team, Century 21 Gold Key Realty. Call Peggy Sewer and or find your dream home or if you're looking to sell. Find them on Facebook at your hometown team, Century 21 Gold Key Realty, or stop in and see them at their location in Marshfield, Wisconsin there. But with that, Brewers talk. We got to get to the Brewers today. Lots of good, a lot of, lot of interesting stuff happened with the Brewers yesterday. A lot of, I mean, there's going to be, there's going to be some anger from some fans over what they saw over this last weekend here. We see the Brewers take a, I mean, a rough, a rough series loss to the Washington Nationals there. And, I mean, first couple games, you know, you look at game two. Game two of that series, I, I seriously, I seriously thought... That the Brewers, I mean, 5 nothing, 5 nothing to open that thing up. And I seriously was sitting there and I'm like, okay. I mean, you know, we're down at, we're down at the Jefferson County Fair this weekend. We're down there uh, showing horses down there. And um, I saw the beginning and I was like, I don't have to pay attention to this, you know. Brewers jump out to a big lead. I'm like, 5 nothing here in the first. The Brewers will be fine. Nationals, three in the fourth, one in the seventh, two in the ninth, over. <laughs> this was a series that the Brewers should have. I mean, it isn't even a should have. This is a series the Brewers definitely should have had, right? And the Nationals just found ways to score runs. Game one, they jumped all over them early. Brewers weren't able to shut them down. They weren't able to add on runs. I mean, this was just a rough series all the way through up, I mean, until game three, right? Game three, the Brewers figured it out. First couple games of the series, the Brewers definitely struggled in this one. So let's look, I mean, let's look game one. Let's look at Friday's game there against the Nationals, a 5-2 to two loss for the Brewers. 12 hits for the Nationals in that one, four for the Brewers in that game. I mean, you look at the lineup, they had four hits, and three of them came off the bat of Sal Frelick. One came from Adamas. In that game. So that tells you where the Brewers were in that one there. Freddie Peralta gets roughed up in that game. Five innings, 10 hits, four earned runs, no walks, six strikeouts, a home run given up. The home run ball continues to be one of the biggest issues for the Milwaukee Brewers. I I don't get it. The Brewers, their pitching staff, I mean, just it just struggles when it comes to the home run ball. The home run ball for the Brewers is definitely the kryptonite. It's definitely the kryptonite of a lot of teams, but this is the kryptonite of the Brewers. This is the thing that holds them back in games. The home run ball absolutely destroys this team. I don't know what it is 
why teams are so consistent against them hitting the home run. I mean, look at Colin Wright, Bryce Wilson, Freddie Peralta. Um, look at the bullpen, Hobie Milner, Piams, Paguero, right? Teams are finding ways to, for, to hit the long ball against these guys. Is it pitch location at times? Yeah. Yeah, it's 100% pitch location. Though I, I just, I mean, man, oh, man, it is a struggle right now. So Freddie gives up a home run in his outing there. Then we saw Piams for an inning, zeros across the board. Good to see from Piams. Milner for two innings there, one hit, one earned run, two Ks, and a walk for him. And then we saw Bryce Wilson for an inning there, one hit and one strikeout. So Milner gets, I mean, gives up another one. Gives up another one in this game. Not a good look for Obi Milner. Not a good look for Obi Milner. And we're gonna—I'm gonna get more into uh, talking about a couple of the guys out of the bullpen there that have struggled and what the heck the Brewers are gonna do because they could use those guys to come back into full force here. Outside of that, I mean, look at the Brewers one for four with runners in scoring position. Seven guys left on base. Didn't have a lot of opportunities with guys on because not many guys were getting on. They had four walks in total. On the game there, two by Terang, one by Contreras, one by Yelich. Outside of that, the only other guys getting on, Frelick three times and Adamas once there. And getting into scoring position was rough for the Brewers in this one. So Brewers, I mean, ultimately end up taking the loss 5-2 to two in this game here. Jesse Winker and Jesse Winker couldn't hit for the Brewers, but goes two for four in this game against the Brewers. He has a home run in this one. <sighs> He had the big. He had the home run against Freddie. He had the home runs against Freddie there. Something that the Brewers hoped he was going to do last year for him. He's been doing this year for the Nationals. I don't know. It's it's difference of area. Worst part is though is he couldn't hit at American Family Field, but he hits for the Nationals at American Family Field, right? I mean that's it, it, it's a rough. It's a it's a rough one for the Brewers there on uh, Friday there. I did not know that Juan Yepes did play for the Nationals. That is Juan Nepes. He played for the Cardinals for a little bit there. Juan Yepes. He played for the Cardinals for a couple of years, 2022 and 2023, and now he's with the Nationals. I did not know that. I did not know that. So not a good start to the series there on Friday for the Brewers. But looking at the Saturday matchup, Brewers dropped that one 6-5 to five also. The Brewers, I mean, like I said earlier, they jump out to that 5 nothing lead in the first. I'm like, okay, here we go. Set the cruise. We're going to be fine. This is going to be the bounce back game. Yesterday was just a fluke. <sighs> Yesterday was just a fluke. We can handle this team. I mean, this isn't that. We're good. You know, here we go. We don't like to sweep a series. We like to just win two out of three. And all of a sudden, Nationals find four in the or three in the top of the fourth. They find one in the seventh. They find two in the top of the ninth. And all of a sudden, we're staring at a six to five hole heading to the bottom of the ninth. And it was just downhill from there. So twelve hits for the Nationals, six for the Brewers in this one. The Brewers again give up. <clears throat> they give up twelve hits in this game. One of them was the big one coming off the bat of C.J. Abrams in this game here, and he had the home run there against Trevor McGill. Late in this one, in the top of the night, there that alt it gave the uh, it gave the Nationals that six to five lead, and ultimately would be base. I mean, the game winning hit for the Nationals in this one. But looking at the Brewers, we saw Churio back in the lineup. He bad uh, in the leadoff spot, one for five. We saw Adamas go one for four. Hoskins one for four with two RBIs in this one here. I believe Hoskins drove in. Yeah, yeah, that. He had a double in this one. He drove in two off of a double in this game. He also had a couple, I mean, the Brewers again with two two out RBIs in this one. Hoskins with two, Haas with two, and then Monasterio had an uh, RBI in this one with two outs in this game here. So, I mean, yeah, going through the lineup there, Frelick one for three. We saw Monasterio go one for one. We saw Haas go one for three with those two RBIs. And, I mean, six hits. We had... Six walks and 12 strikeouts in this game. Six hits, six walks, 12 strikeouts. The strikeout numbers, once again, bite the Brewers in this one. And it also came down to the home run ball. Once again, bit the Brewers. Because we look at the box score in this one. <clears throat> think what you want. I didn't think Dallas Keuchel pitched terrible in this game. Wasn't able to get deep. If that's the way you want to look at it, wasn't able to get deep. But... Didn't give up a boatload of runs. Three innings, eight hits, three uh, earned runs, two strikeouts. 
Is it a great outing? No. Is it good enough? Depending on the standards, right? Depending on the standards. He, you know, you're not getting what Dallas Keuchel right now with him, with him before, right? Because now we get see him get DFA'd there. But with him before, you weren't going to get... We weren't getting Dallas Keuchel from when he won, you know, was up there for Cy Young's, so, you know, when he was an ace of a staff. That's not the Dallas Keuchel we were getting. We were getting a crafty, hopefully crafty veteran who could find ways to get ground balls. That's a guy that we were hoping for. And we're hoping for that experience in the rotation. You know, the only thing I sum it up to, when you spend a dollar on a piece of meat, right? I mean, maybe maybe you're talking about dollar hot dog day at American Family Field, right? You spend a dollar on a piece of meat. Is it going to be the highest quality piece of meat you ever had? Is it going to be the, you know, select cut? That you want to, you know, put on a serving platter and give out to your your neighbor that you want to impress? No, no, not even in the not even in the ballpark of that, right? It's going to be good enough, right? That that's that's all you can look at as you were hoping it was going to be good enough. It wasn't going to be great. You wouldn't have got it for a dollar if it was going to be this greatest thing that you ever, I mean, that you ever had, right? For a dollar. You were just hoping for, I mean, a three, around a three ERA. You were hoping for a guy who got ground balls and a guy who could get you through five. Maybe five, right? Sometimes four, but maybe five. Keep the, you're not going to get a lot of strikeouts. Keep the walks down and let the defense try and do the work. It was a little bit of everything with Dallas Keuchel. It it didn't seem like he gave up a lot of runs. You know, uh, looking at, I was just going to check out his, Official game logs there from his, I mean, just few outings that he had with the Milwaukee Brewers there. But looking at the outings that he had against the Rangers, he started one game, uh, four innings, five earned runs, five earned runs in the month of June off that one outing. And then into July, Colorado Rockies, five and a third, two earned runs against the Dodgers there, four and a third, zero earned runs on three hits. And then on his most recent outing, which would be the one from Saturday, he had three innings, three earned runs in that one. I mean, was was he bad enough that it was a much-needed DFA? No. No. He, He was a placeholder. He was just buying time and hoping that he could get to four so that he could throw a bullpen. That was basically your bullpen day. Right, that Dallas Keuchel was your bullpen day. That's fine, right? I mean, we we have a lot of those. We have a lot of those guys right now. Is the issue we have an opener for Colin Ray? We have an opener when Bryce Wilson was in the rotation. We had an opener for Bryce Wilson. We love openers. Dallas Keuchel could have been your opener. The only thing that I can venture to guess with this whole Dallas Keuchel situation, they were just ripping the band aid off before the All Star break. Because Devin Williams is going to come back, D.L. Hall is going to come back, and possibly Joe Ross is going to come back. You got to make a move, right? Who's the one guy where if you got rid of him, you DFA'd him? What's the one guy who you would say to yourself, "Ah, we're not really going to, we're not really a hundred percent going to miss this guy because we only spent a dollar on him, right? He was the odd man out. Look at the rotation: Freddie Myers." Uh, Ray, I'm missing somebody. I'm missing somebody off the top of my head there. Freddie, Myers, Ray. I mean, yeah, Bryce Wilson, but he doesn't really, I mean, doesn't qualify as a starter for me right now. He's a bullpen guy. Ah, uh, geez. So we had Freddie, we had, who pitched today? That was Ray. Ray pitched in that one today. So it would have been. Savali, you have Savali, and you just made the trade for Savali there. So Savali's not going to be an odd man out. You're going to have D.L. Hall and Joe Ross coming back, so who's your odd man out? There it is, Dallas Keuchel. So the only thing that I can think of is not a crazy amount warranted this, right? I'm not talking about a guy who's giving up 30 runs. I'm not talking about a guy who looked like complete, absolute garbage when he was out there. Was he great? No. Was he good enough? 
you know, was he as good as a $1 hot dog? Maybe. I mean, I'm a big fan of a $1 hot dog, right? That's my favorite day. That's my favorite day at American Family Field is when I can have a $1 hot dog. So I'm not going to say that it isn't a great day with, you know, with a, with a $1 hot dog. But he, he wasn't horrible. He wasn't the worst thing that has ever, I mean, Matt Garza, we've had Matt Garza before. So nobody can say he was the worst pitcher that the Brewers have had, right? He just, he wasn't, he was never going to be that Cy Young guy. Right? He was never going to be that Cy Young guy. He wasn't going to get back to that point. That's what I think a lot of people for, failed to realize along the way there. So Dallas Keuchel gets DFA'd, ba- I mean, basically right after that start. Like, that was it. We had, they wanted to see one more. I Basically use him one more time, and then they were good. Then they were good. We're going to get Hall back. We're going to get Joe Ross back eventually. We'll see on the flip side, dude. You still got Jacob Junis in the bullpen, right? Jacob Junis is the bullpen. Bryce Wilson is still in the bullpen. Even though, honestly, I would leave Bryce Wilson in the bullpen. I want to touch him out there because I feel like bullpen Bryce is better than starter Bryce. So I'd leave him in the bullpen, but that's my opinion. They might bring him back in the starting role. We'll wait and see on that one there. But like I said, in that game, we saw Junis give up a home run in relief there. Three and a third, two hits, one earned run, it, one strikeout, and that home run given up. Paguero inning in a third there, two walks and a strikeout. And then Trevor McGill blows the save. Inning in a third, two hits, two earned runs, two strikeouts, and that home run given up there to C.J. Abrams late in this one. And the Brewers just couldn't find it in the bottom half. They could not find a way to drive in that winning run. Got a winning run on. Got it, or not a winning run. They've been tying run. Got the tying run on there with Jake Bowers. He ended up at second base for Joey Ortiz, and Ortiz just wasn't able to drive him in there from second. That would have been the game-tying run in that one. So, Brewers, after that, they're just looking to salvage salvage something out of this series here because we're looking at a potential getting swept before the All-Star break by the Washington Nationals. Not a very good look. Not a very good look for a team that has been very much um, very, very much exceeding expectations here in the first half of the season. If they would have got swept by the Nationals before the All-Star break, Definitely would have been a shot. Definitely would have been a uh, shot to morale there. But the Brewers, they find a way. They find a big way to take game three of the series there. Brewers win 9-3 in that one. 12 hits for the Brewers, 7 for the Nationals. It's one, two errors for the Brewers in this game, though. In that one, we saw everybody get a hit outside of Bowers and uh, Churio in this one. We saw Terang get a hit in that leadoff spot. Contreras, he had a hit and an RBI in this one. Yelich goes one for four. Adamas goes four for four in this game here with four RBIs and two runs scored there and a walk. He also had a big home run. I believe he was only a triple shy of the cycle in this one. Frelick goes two for five. He continues to have a swing a hot bat in this one. Joey Ortiz two for two for uh, two for three in this game here. Bowers all for three. Churro all for three. And then Mitchell. This is what we've been waiting to see. He sends a absolute missile to dead center field, sends it over the wall, hits a home big home run for the Brewers. There's something that we've been waiting to see out of Mitchell was a little bit of that power, a little bit of that pop. Prove to us that you're on a baseball, and we saw it in that one. Straight dead center drives a missile out of here, and there's nothing better. Love to see it. Love to see it there out of Garrett Mitchell. So great stuff there in that aspect. But looking at Sal Frelick, I mean, two for five in this one here. He's got the average up to 275 right now. And looking at him over the last seven games for Sal, he's batting 333 over the last seven, 333 over the last 15, and 316 over the last 30 games. Talk about playing well. Everybody's talking about Yelich. They're talking about Contreras. Why isn't Terang in the All Star game? Well, look at Sal Frelick here. Might not be the biggest power. I mean, the power threat that you'd ever see, right? But this guy is consistently putting bat to ball, and he's driving. He's not driving. I mean, I want to say he's driving it. He's not driving it. He's got a couple of hard hit balls out there, but this is a guy who's just putting it out there and he's making things happen with bloopers and everything else in between. So love what I'm seeing out of Sal here. I mean, 17 hits in 15 games, 31 in 30 games there. Love to see it. Love to see it there out of Sal Frelick. So good stuff there 
for Sale and for the Brewers when he is hitting there, especially in the middle of that order, getting things going. Uh, good to see Joey Ortiz get go for two for uh, three in this one. Joey Ortiz, like we know, he's been out for a while, comes back, had a couple of games there where he was a little bit rough, but I mean, I mean, getting it going, hopefully getting it going here, coming into and going off of that all-star break. Also, Willie Adamas. We need Adamas to get going, right? Adamas is a main cog in this offense. If he's going, it's going. And, well, 4-4 four for four in this one, that's a good start, especially heading into a little bit of a break here. So hopefully we see him get his bat right and get going again. Also, Contreras, I mean, he's going to play a little bit in the all-star game. Hopefully after that he gets a well, well-needed, well-earned break and William Contreras can start hitting the baseball around like we saw a little bit there to start the year there. So the Brewers, they drive in nine runs in this game here. They were 5 for 14 with runners in scoring position. They left eight guys on. Not a bad day by any means. Zastrini started it for the Brewers, inning in a third there. No hits, no earned runs, one strikeout. Colin Ray goes five and two-thirds, five hits, and two earned runs, seven strikeouts. Milner for an inning there, two hits, one earned run, and zeros after that. And Piumps for an inning, zeros and three strikeouts in this one. The Brewers tally up 11 strikeouts in this game here. Great stuff. Great stuff to see. Great stuff to see out of, out of a Brewers team that is needing one of these two. Hobie Milner and Yoel Piamps. They desperately need one of these two to just figure out something. Just figure out something. Just get back to what do we know about Yoel Piamps? What do we know about Hobie Milner? We need one of those guys to get to that. You know, what we saw from last season, what we saw at the start of this year, that is what the Brewers desperately need those guys to return to here. Piamps, I mean, you look at last season, became the setup man for the Brewers, became the setup man. To start this year, he was in a closing role a little bit, right? And as of late, I mean, the ERA has bounced around for uh, you all, Piamps. I'm not even sure, to be honest with you, where to put him in a role. Because you look at his outings, I mean, going back to, we could look all the way back to the month of July so far. He's given up three runs, three earned runs in the month of July. Gave year, uh, in, in the month of June, he gave up five earned runs. In the month of May, he gave up five earned runs. In the month of April, he's given up four earned runs. And then in March... He gave up zero earned runs. So, I mean, it's what kind of role do you put him in? Where could you see Yoel Piamps fitting in to this bullpen? You know, can he be a high leverage guy? Because my high leverage guys, Yoel Piamps gets himself into some dangerous situations, right? Not, I mean, looking at the month of April, he had one bad outing, right? Gave up those four earned runs against the Minnesota Twins. Looking at the month of May, he had a couple bad outings in a row against Kansas City and the Pirates. And then outside of that, the strikeout numbers down a little bit for Yoel Piumps. But, you know, getting outs where he can. He gave up one run against the Cubs there. And then he has another run given up there against the Phillies. That was a walk-off. And then we saw the Angels. He gave up a run. He gave up a run to San Diego in all three games that he pitched in against the Padres, two against the Cubs, and a couple uh, a couple days later then. And then we see him face the Rockies, and he gives up a run. Then he gives up three to the Pirates. So it's like the inconsistency of Yoel Piamps makes you nervous. What kind of role can he put him in? Can he be a set of man? Can he be the seventh inning guy? Can he be a high leverage guy, or does he need to be you know a little less leverage? Hoey Milner, same thing. Hoey Milner's in the exact same boat as Yoel Piamps, but I would say Hobie is just a little bit worse. Just because Hobie does not have the swing and miss stuff that I believe Yoel Piamps has. Hobie Milner is more of, I got to get you out through the air, the ground, keeping it in the ballpark, dotting corners because I don't have dominant stuff. And that is the issue. He doesn't have the dominant stuff, yet he pitches like he does. And the home run balls have been prevalent against Hobie Milner. I mean, you look at his first outing of the year. Against the Mets, home run given up. And then you look at the month of April. He gave up, I believe it was, two home runs in the month of April. Looking at the month of May, he pitched solid in the month of May. No home runs, six earned runs. Not terrible by any means, but getting towards the end of the month, 
One run given up against Miami, one against Boston, one against Chicago, three against Chicago. Not great stuff there. Then we flash forward into June there and ends up giving up another home run to the Detroit Tigers who end up scoring three earned runs against them there. Then one against San Diego, two against San Diego in his second appearance against the Padres, one against the Rangers. And then we look at the Rockies series, gave up one, gave up one against Pittsburgh, one against the Nationals, one against the Nationals once again. Oh, Miller's consistently giving up a run. <clears throat> that reminds me of a guy named Diego Vieira, and we ended up getting rid of Diego Vieira. So, I mean, what are their roles in the bullpen? Because you can only have so many guys that you can pitch only in the fifth or sixth inning, right, with a five-run lead. We can only have so many guys like that. We need guys who can be locked down after that. So then do you put Caning, because he was pitching so well, does he end up in the back end of the bullpen with Brian Hudson, with Devin Williams when he comes back, and with <sighs> Paguero right now. Paguero's been, you know, up in the air. He's just solid. He's like a sixth or seventh inning guy, right? But we have so many of them. We don't have a lot of dominance right now. Brian Hudson, I would say he's pitched well enough. McGill is also in there. He blew a save in his last outing. Outside of that, though, he's been decent or pretty solid for the Brewers and filled the role that was desperately needed. Dem Williams, we're hoping he can come back and be what Dem Williams is supposed to be. From what I heard, from what Jake Bowers said after facing me, he said, I can see why everybody says where the word about this guy is true. Like, this guy's nasty. So all of his stuff is back. All of his stuff is looking filthy. Like, that's good news. That's good news that we're hearing something like that. Points to Dem Williams will be back, and he will be ready to go and ready to go in his normal role there. So that's good stuff in that aspect. I mean... Zastrini's pitched well. Bryce Wilson has pitched solid at times for the Brewers in a long relief role. And we're going to see D.L. Hall come back. Where does he slot in? I I think the bullpen. To be honest, I think the bullpen. And once Joe Ross comes back, where does he slot in? Is he going to be back in the rotation? Are they going to send somebody down? Are they going to put him in the bullpen? Where, where does he going to go? Where's he going to go? So you have lots of bits and pieces of players that you need to figure out slowly as they return to the major league roster, where they're going to go. And that's going to push around Milner and Piams into roles that maybe they haven't been to yet. I I just, I, I would struggle to keep them in high leverage situations because I just don't trust them to be able to do it. I don't. I trusted Milner at one point. I don't right now. It seems like it's a consistent run every time he's out there, right? He's going to give up one. How, I'm not sure, but he's going to, he's given up a run, just a matter of how and when, right? So, I don't know. I don't know. We'll definitely see with that one here with Hobie Milner. But like I was saying there, I mean, reinforcements are on the way, you know, after the All-Star break. We saw Joey Ortiz come back, but we're going to see D.L. Hall. We're going to see Devin Williams. We're going to see guys return to the big league roster here for the Brewers. Guys that, I mean, look at Devin Williams, right? Everybody's looking at this bullpen and they're saying, well, they're not that good. There's holes in that bullpen. Devin Williams ain't even there yet, right? Devin Williams is not there. So if Devin Williams comes back and he can be 95% of the Devin Williams we know, they're already that much better. Right. And I mean, you factor in that Abner Uribe was so supposed to play such a huge role in this bullpen. And well, now we see him. He gets in a fight, ends up in minors, ends up, you know, in a fight down there, ends up in, you know, on the injured list and now has knee surgery. So we're not going to see Abner Uribe back at all this season. That does not help. That does not help whatsoever. Maybe D.L. Hall comes in, he fills a role like that, uh, Abner Uribe role. We know Devin will, or we know that D.L. Hall can touch triple digits, right? We know he can run it up there. Maybe we see him come in, fills that role, and maybe comes the seventh inning guy, right? A lefty there in that seventh inning. That would be a solid, I think that'd be a solid move for the Brewers there. So maybe we see something like that. But like I'm saying, re- reinforcements are on the way everything will be okay for the Milwaukee Brewers here going forward. It's just getting them back, getting them ready to go. And hopefully we see, I mean, the Brewers come out this second half, just guns a-blazing there. I mean, we got lots more to get into with the Brewers tomorrow there. Talking about talking about this first half before the all the pre-All-Star break first half of the season there. Talking about stats, talking about who's been good for the Brewers, who hasn't. Talking about some of the returners, where they stand right now in standings-wise. 
projections heading towards the second half, right? Lots of good things to talk about there with the Milwaukee Brewers moving forward there. But right now, I want to look quick, before we wrap it up for the day, I want to look. Tonight will be the 2024 Home Run Derby coming up there from Arlington, Texas. They're at Globe Life Field there. And looking at some of the participants for this one, some of the participants that we'll see in this one, Gunnar Henderson from the Baltimore Orioles. If you guys have listened and you know about the crossover show there with uh, Aaron from Bruliana Sports, he's a big Orioles fan, so he's super excited to see Gunnar Henderson get into this one. Gunnar, 27 home runs on the season. His longest home run was 430 uh, feet there against the Rays. His hardest hit home run of 2024 was 112.3 miles per hour on April 29th against the Yankees there. So, I mean, Gunnar Henderson, 27 home runs on the season already. He belted 28 home runs in his 2023 All-Rookie of the Year campaign. Now he's got 27 here already in the first half. That is crazy. That is crazy stuff there. The blossom that we're seeing out of Gunnar Henderson for the Orioles. Next up, we have a guy, no stranger. No stranger to the home run derby. Pete Alonzo from the Mets. He's got 18 home runs on the air. His longest home run of 2024 was 446 feet. That happened on June 4th against the Nationals. Hardest hit was 115. That was against the Phillies there. It's going to be his fifth home run derby. uh, It's going to be his fifth home run derby appearance for Pete Alonso there. Alec Baum for the Phillies. He's got 11 home runs on the air. Longest home run was 427 feet. His hardest hit was 106. Not, I, you know, but he's a guy who's in here, but you know, it's like, it's like Jalen Brown in the NBA dunk contest. Like he's there, but you know, he's just there. Bobby Witt for the Royals, 15 home runs on the season. Their longest home run was 468 feet against the Tigers. His hardest hit ball was 112 miles per hour against the Rockies there. So Bobby Witt Jr., an exciting player for the Royals, gets in there. Marcelo Zuna from the Braves, 24 home runs on the season. 446 feet against the Marlins there was his longest. 114 miles per hour on a home run there against the Marlins. That was the same ball. So the one that he hit, 446 feet, he hit 114 miles per hour there. Next up, we have Jose Ramirez from the Cleveland Guardians. His longest hit home run of 2024 was 436 feet. His hardest hit was 109. That was against the Orioles there. So Jose Ramirez will be participating in the home run derby. Oh, uh, and Lotus Garcia from the Rangers there, 17 home runs on the season. 428 feet is his longest. And that same one, he had 110 miles per hour there. Big fella from the Texas Rangers, going to try to show out for the home crowd. Teoscar Hernandez from the Dodgers, 19 home runs on the season. 431 was his longest there against the Giants. His hardest hit came against the Marlins. That was 108 miles per hour there for him. If I had to, if I had to guess, longest home run. Who's gonna, who is gonna win the home run derby? I'm gonna go with. I'm gonna take Marcelo Zuna from the Braves. I'm gonna take Marcelo Zuna, a guy that I would want to see win it. A guy that I would really want to see win it is Bobby Witt because I feel like Bobby is like a jack of all trades player, right? Good defense. Good, I mean, I mean, it's got great speed. He's got extra base hit up the uh, wazoo. I mean, triples, doubles, everything in between. He's a guy who moves the baseball and gets on for you. The home run ball, I mean, we're talking 15 for him, right? He's got 15 home runs on the season already. He had a 30 for 30 campaign, uh, campaign last season there for him in 2023, but got his first all-star nod this year. And now we're seeing him in the home run derby. I think it'd be definitely cool to see him win it. I don't, you know, Gunner seeing Gunner Henderson win it too. I, I think that'd be cool. That'd be cool. You know, seeing Gunner win it there. A young guy, a young guy. I don't want to see Pete Alonzo win it. I don't want to see Pete Alonzo. I really don't. I'm done with the polar bear. I serious. After he got the All Star nod, it irritated me enough. I mean, Christian Walker was well deserving. This whole All Star game baloney irritated me with the first base position with the second base position. It all irritated me there. But with that. That's about all I got for today. I I said I was going to get into the Brewers draft. I'm going to wait 
you know, we, we ran a little bit long already today. I'm going to wait. We're going to get the second round in. We're going to get third round in, you know, get a little bit deeper in the draft. And then I'll be able to just start spewing out prospects. We'll have a brewer day. We'll have a brewer day here on the show. But in other, I mean, in other exciting news and awesome news and was great to see. And I guess no matter where you stand on it, I guess it was, in, in my opinion, it was pretty awesome, was we saw a Brewers minor league player, Wes Clark. He was baptized on the field. He was baptized on the field with teammates watching, with fans watching, and also by his teammate, Brewer Hicklin there. So that was awesome. Saw the video of it uh, on the Nashville Sounds page, and that was awesome to see. That was awesome to see there. And, you know, the comments that he had flooding in from teammates and everything like that that are, you know, supporting his decision and, you know, hope for the best for him and everything like that. That was great. That was great stuff to see that. So, I mean, just awesome. Just an awesome thing that I saw on social media uh, as of late here. So great stuff there. Great stuff. Great story to end the show here. So like I always say, please, if you can, if you have a minute, leave a review on the show. Go down in the bio of this show where it gives a description of everything that was talked about. Click send us a text message. Click that. It'll send us fan mail. We can answer any of your question, questions here on the show there, or just leave a review on there. Leave a review wherever you're listening to. Leave a uh, rating, whatever you can do. It's, it's always great to hear back from the fans there. Don't forget, follow on Facebook, Wisconsin Sports on the Go Trage. Also, Instagram, Twitter, wherever you can find us there. So with that, this has been Wisconsin Sports on the Go with Trage. Thank you guys for listening. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your Monday. But until I talk to you guys again tomorrow, deuces. Yeah, oh my Lord, watch me sway. Darkness falls and we all pray. Hoping for the light of day Down to the river I have held the devil's hand Felt the weight of my own sin Burdened by the heart of man Down to the river Down to the river oh.